Welcome back, everyone. For those of you who are viewing this video first, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Danielle Plotz, and I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. I work as part of an interdisciplinary team and a day rehabilitation program for children and adolescents with a variety of diagnoses and conditions, including acquired brain injuries. As a reminder, this is the fourth video in a series on traumatic brain injury. So if you have not had a chance to see the first three videos in this series, which discusses an overview of neuroanatomy, classification of brain injury, and sequelae after brain injury, I encourage you to check those out for additional information. In this segment, I will be discussing mild traumatic brain injury, or commonly referred to as concussion, and some of the myths related to mild traumatic brain injury. I will be using concussion and mild traumatic brain injury interchangeably throughout this presentation. So just as a reminder, a mild traumatic brain injury is classified as such because of a variety of severity indicators. There's a loss of consciousness of 30 minutes or less, a Glasgow coma scale between 13 and 15, and a PTA or post-traumatic amnesia equal to or less than 24 hours. Again, mild traumatic brain injuries have normal imaging, and if there are positive findings on imaging, then it is referred to as a complicated mild TBI. During my experience helping families who have sought help for a suspected concussion, there are many myths that I have heard about diagnoses and treatment. Some of these myths can be barriers in identifying a concussion and helping with recovery. So, to start with, if you didn't get knocked out, you don't have a concussion. This is definitely a myth. You don't have to lose consciousness to sustain a concussion. Even if someone did not lose consciousness by the incident, it is important to be aware of symptoms, including headaches, nausea, vomiting, and confusion. This next thought I hear frequently from families and other medical providers, the idea that the brain needs complete and total rest after a concussion is definitely a myth. It was previously recommended to avoid any mental stimulation, which often led to recommendations of sitting in a dark room with no reading or electronics. However, new studies suggest that a small degree of activity may actually help the brain recover more quickly. The most recent CDC guidelines for MTBI recommend pacing or a gradual return to cognitive and physical activities as tolerated by symptoms. In one study, researchers looked at two groups of kids with concussions, those who take it easy for about two or three days and then gradually return to daily activities like school, actually recovered more quickly than those who were put on total rest for five days. In our clinic, the general approach is moderate and symptom-based. If a child can read a book without feeling ill effects, then it's fine to read. However, if a child gets a headache after texting or using a phone for an hour, then maybe limiting calls to 10 or 15 minutes at a time could be helpful. It is expected that children will return to school with some lingering symptoms, which often worsen temporarily during the school day. There are common accommodations that can be put into place to help the child tolerate the school environment as the recovery continues. Although for many people, it seems more intuitive to delay the return to school altogether, we want to avoid having kids far behind with their schoolwork, as for many children, having additional makeup work on top of the typical school demands can actually further increase symptoms and potentially prolong recovery. Sometimes I hear families say that because they were wearing a helmet at the time, they couldn't have possibly gotten a concussion, or if they were wearing helmets, that they couldn't possibly get another concussion. This is also a myth. Helmets are designed to prevent skull fractures and not concussions. Children and teens should absolutely wear helmets during high-risk activities, but there are certain forces and mechanisms, as I mentioned in the previous video, like whiplash types of injuries or rotational forces that helmets cannot protect against. There is simply no helmet in existence that makes a child concussion-proof. It is also important to remember that a helmet cannot prevent a person who has a concussion from getting re-injured. Finally, many people have preconceived notions about how long it takes for concussions to resolve. This may be based on their own experiences or information they've heard elsewhere. It is important to remember that every concussion is different and every child is different. Some can improve quickly within the first day or two, but it is not uncommon for children to take weeks or months to recover fully. Longitudinal studies suggest that most children with an MTBI recover from the initial symptoms within six weeks after injury. 
with about 30 to 60% having persistent symptoms at the one month post-injury mark, 10% at three months post-injury, and less than 5% are still symptomatic at one year post-injury. There are four primary domains of common symptoms following concussion, physical, thinking, emotional, and sleep symptoms. Physical symptoms can include things like headache, nausea, fatigue, visual problems, balance problems, sensitivity to both light and noise, numbness and tingling, vomiting, dizziness. Then there are thinking symptoms that include feeling mentally foggy, problems concentrating, problems remembering, and feeling more slowed down overall with their thinking speed. Emotional symptoms can also arise and include increased irritability, feelings of sadness, feeling more emotional in general, and increased worry or nervousness. Sleep symptoms include difficulty falling asleep, sleeping less than usual, drowsiness, or sleeping more than usual. And for preschoolers, there are actually some different symptoms that might be observed, including behavioral changes, nightmares, complaining of a stomach ache, or increased frequency of urinary accidents during the day or at night when they previously had urinary control. So some of the most commonly reported symptoms include headache, which tends to be the number one reported symptom, and then nausea, dizziness, some sort of mental status change or disorientation, loss of consciousness, or difficulty remembering what happened after the injury, and vomiting are also frequently endorsed. It is important to consider all of these symptoms individually, but also how they may impact other experiences of symptoms. As you can see from this chart, each of these factors have an impact on other symptoms. For example, having a headache can impact our ability to focus or concentrate, and can also impact our ability on how social we might be. Not only is it important to consider the relationship between these symptoms, and of course the individual symptoms themselves, but it's important to consider other factors that might impact the traumatic brain injury. Of course, severity of injury and age at the time of injury were discussed in the previous video, but also time since injury, the stress of the injury, lifestyle before the injury, role demands, resources and services available, and the ability to adapt to changes. Another important aspect to consider is the overlap of symptoms with other possible conditions. For example, if the injury occurred in a setting in which there was a traumatic event, it may also be reasonable to look at diagnoses like post-traumatic stress disorder. This makes assessment especially challenging as it becomes part of the job to determine which symptoms are due to concussion and which are due to the stress associated with the event or other co-occurring mental health conditions, depression, substance abuse. As mentioned previously, individuals with co-occurring health conditions are at increased risk for prolonged recovery. There are consensus statements and a report to Congress published that are easily accessible on the CDC website that provides information about diagnoses and management. Specifically, it is important for healthcare professionals to monitor recovery and provide recommendations for sleep, returning to physical activity, returning to cognitive activity, returning to school, and to provide education about the recovery process. As I mentioned, recently it's been recommended that individuals who have sustained a mild traumatic brain injury engage in pacing or a gradual return to both cognitive and physical activities as tolerated by symptoms. However, implementation of those recommendations remains variable. Further research is ongoing to help determine more specifically the ideal duration and intensity of rest, as well as more specific times in which to introduce both cognitive and physical activities. There is a publication on the guidelines in more detail on the management of mild TBI that can be found in JAMA in 2018. As a reminder, this video has been one part of a larger series to provide information to those that may be working with children and adolescents who have had a traumatic brain injury. In upcoming segments, you can expect to hear more about topics that cover educational management of students with TBI and specifics about the special education process as well as best teaching practices. Thank you for your time and I hope that you found the information helpful. If you are interested in learning more about brain injury, please go to the Kennedy Krieger Institute's brain injury website found at the end of this video. Thank you.